Recording has started, Carlo. Thanks, Dan. Okay, now we'll give it uh, maybe another minute until five past and then we can start. All right, uh, welcome everyone. So this is a seminar on, on copyright and uh, with a particular emphasis on the changes in the EU. Um, thank you very much for registering. This uh, call is being recorded and I will now start sharing my screen. I hope this will work fine. If not, uh, please let me know. I will also try to move the screen forward, which uh, with some uh, online web applications is a problem and with some it works just fine. So just give me a hint if the slides don't move. And I can see that they're not moving. So there we go. I will try and uh, go out again. Um, and just, I might just have to run this from, um, not from a presentation view. Let's see if I can at least maximize the screen. What do they say in the movies take two? Hope that works okay. I hope I can now move the slides. No, I can still not move the slides, fortunately. Um, Right, so perhaps the easiest is if I uh, will just speak to, to my slides and I offer you to share those after, after the call. Um, so, Carlo, do you want me to uh, present your slides for you? Uh, if you have them, that, that's great. Um, yes, that would be an ideal solution. Thank you so much, Dan. Oh, Dan, thank you so much. So if you could just flip to the next one where people can then see what we will traverse as topics. So uh, a brief uh, overview of copyright, uh, um, how it works at the global and EU level. Uh, and then we dive into the EU newest addition to copyright, the Digital Single Market Directive, and deal then specifically with issues to do with online responsibility. You will see further down when we drill down that in fact a key uh, take home for today should be that um, the law is not automatically leading necessarily to the best outcomes. You have to fight for your rights. In this case, it's a rather peaceful fight. You just have to enable um, platforms by giving them information that is relevant and necessary to uh, make sure your works are shared appropriately. Dan, if you could move the slides. So here I've tried to put into one slide uh, the international global copyright landscape. You would see under global that is really 180 plus countries of the world that subscribe to various treaties of WIPO. That's the World Intellectual Property Organization based in Geneva, a UN specialized organization. 
never mind the acronyms, in the notes to this presentation, you will find links and references to them. What the global scheme does, it establishes a minimum level of harmonization um, that uh, applies pretty much throughout the world. And then the neat, tidy, global, harmonized copyright gets then complicated, if you will, by bespoke agreements that countries uh, have with each other. Those are the last bullet there, free trade agreements. Each country uh, concludes those. Those cover large areas, but they also cover typically intellectual property. And then further um, specify or amplify rights that are protected between countries. Also at global level, you have the so-called TRIPS panels. This is sort of a international trade dispute. You get other international tribunals and courts that rule uh, either quite a lot or infrequently on copyright issues. And then in the EU, you have a set um, number of directives that constitute the EU copyright law, which member states have to adhere to. And I've listed there uh, the, most, the most frequently uh, used ones. Uh, six copyright directives and then the e-commerce directive which is really the one dealing with safe harbors for isps traditionally that directive is currently being revised and perhaps replaced with a regulation called the dsa the digital single market act and the dma the digital market act regulation you will also find there cross-cutting regulations on enforcement that cover not just copyright, but the other forms of IP, patents, trademarks, and uh, designs. And then uh, there are consumer protection directives, accessibility, portability, but accessibility also affecting the um, greater availability of works that can be uh, accessed by visually impaired persons. So at the lower level of this uh, pyramid, you then come to the national law. So you have the international harmonization then the EU directives and at the end of the day, national law. We're now in the UK where uh, UK has left the EU. You also have just UK national law at that stage. You could turn uh, to the next slide. So the latest addition in Europe uh, to this is the DSM Directive, Digital Single Market Directive. And again, I've tried in one slide to summarize the key areas of changes and to categorize them. Um, other people might categorize the law, these, these laws differently, but I think this works quite well from a, from a publishing perspective. So you have rules on exceptions, and I think for STM, uh, very important, the text and data mining rules, which are maybe a bit of a trailblazer in the world. Um, again, for SDM and those having tertiary learning materials in your publishing programs, the online and cross-border education exceptions, cultural heritage, such as long-term preservation, or if you're in the HASS sphere of publishing, National libraries uh, will also be interested in the cultural heritage digitization provisions and out of commerce provisions. Um, exceptions are, if you will, negative space, like in a sculpture, you could define the sculpture as uh, the body that you see chiseled of stone, or you could look at it uh, maybe the way Rodin used to describe it himself as the negative space created by chipping away. So exceptions in many ways are just the other side of the coin of the exclusive rights. And those are for a rights holder, publisher, perhaps the main thing. And you see there on the fair play, some modifications. Those do not really benefit um the first part science publishers it's the news publishers perhaps you have seen the shenanigans playing out in australia between facebook and australian government this is a similar operation here in europe where press publishers have a new right to get some revenue from online platforms Similarly, uh, maybe the most contentious piece of this copyright reform was the online content sharing 
uh, platform provision article 17 in the draft directive this was article 13 and much blood has been spilt on the page which makes the article very long i think uh, nine paragraphs and a great number i have not counted them of recitals in the directive give more uh, contours but to some extent also contradictions that uh, this art, article 17 entails it is the article we're going to dive into in a in a moment other areas that have seen substantial changes through the dsm is the collective management of rights and that should be important to you particularly if you have a publishing program active in germany because germany is due to a bad case uh, uh law suddenly publishers could no longer receive collective management fees from collective management organizations that started back in 2013 and uh, has now been sort of remedied now we're back where we were before if you will and there's still an open question in germany actually whether publishers will be able to recoup some of the lost revenue in the in intermittent re years i would not hold my breath but uh, please uh, it's an area that will also need to be followed um contracts this is an area where greater equity is being pursued between authors and publishers um i think it is fair to say that many of the rules are simply good manners let's say of how to treat uh, authors as publishers and perhaps more relevant for um, other rights holders to which these same provisions also apply i think many of the contractual provisions mandate their informing people about royalties royalty statements etc are uh, self-evident um, there can be national implementations that can have a bite and for sdm publishers in the journal publishing field perhaps um, there can be questions as many journals are either open access or uh, as an industry custom do not involve uh, royalty payments to authors and author multiple author teams but generally in national implementation as far as i've seen that has been captured uh, well and has not led to confusion so far uh, dan if we could move the slide So now we're diving into the main uh, subject of this conversation here, Article 17, also known as the value gap, VGAP, essentially driven by the notion that large technology companies have um, reaped benefits disproportionately at the expense of copyright holders in setting up their business models. And Article 17, hooray, hooray, uh, went out to rejig the balance and reject the negotiation power between uh, publishers, producers, authors, performers, and the large tech companies. I think the jury is still out whether it will really achieve that in every of the sectors, but it certainly has given new tools and an evolution of the erstwhile simple safe harbor that uh, is uh, wound up with the US Digital Millennium Act which uh, more than 20 years ago basically just treated these platforms as telecommunication companies that were just like carrying uh, wire and did not really have business models that involved um, knowledge and organization of content. As you, as you know, the internet today, I think that is far from the way that in fact the internet has been developed most platforms have a major say in organizing serving up uh, sometimes enhancing or otherwise steering content and article 17 reflects this so in the stm space there are it's no surprise to you there are many platforms that uh, are active they tend to be more specialized than the big ones that are in the public eye YouTube um, may have uh, science concepts explained in tutorial videos, but it's, it's not primarily known for where you would go to as a scientist. However, there are many specialized sites where uh, your authors would showcase their articles or communicate with other interested scientists 
for the general public. And for uh, many of these platforms, uh, the, this change in the law is highly relevant. If you can uh, go to the next slide then. So for, for SDM publishers, the, the relevance is really you know what obligations are on these platforms at the moment you, you might have heard the expression whack-a-mole where effectively you send a notice and notice and takedown and then the same content pops up minutes later on the same platform or a different platform etc so while article 17 can't change that worldwide certainly as far as the eu is concerned there is now a norm that doesn't simply state uh, a platform is enjoys a safe harbor if it meets certain criteria. In fact, the platform has a co-responsibility to ensure that uh, infringing content is not served up or if served up is removed uh, ex exped expeditiously. I have listed there uh, the notion that there are 40 plus platforms. I think depending on content, not or 40s will be in general use for your uh, uh, audiences and authors. But I think that, nar that number is still, is still a good number, which was revealed as part of the uh, article sharing principles that STM developed uh, a few years back, about 2014-15. Dan, if we can move the slide. So how does it how does it work? Who is affected? So you have a definition of OCSSP, which is an unwieldy acronym, which I for now would call platform, uh, even though there are platforms that fall outside. You see it there under exclusions on the side. But basically, it's a fairly broad category, if you will, of platforms that mainly deal in content. I think it's as simple as that. So to give an example, if if you are own a bakery down the road and you also have a website where people serve uh, and can order bread, you're not you you don't come into this OCSSP. If you start to market uh, your bread worldwide um, as a delivery system, maybe Uber like uh, bakery delivery and you're using as a significant proportion um, con copyright protected content as bait or as advertising, then maybe even though your main business may be just bread, you could fall under this. So it's a matter of degree or of size. There are various um, definitorial exclusions for small or fledgling platforms. They get a bit of a break. So if you if your platform is younger than three years, if it has certain, not a certain click rate, if you will, then it might just get by not falling under the same. But as we shall see later due to case law, uh, it is still a uh, very useful thing to look at the DSM, even if you are such a platform. And I may say this, if you are a fledgling startup platform, you say, ah, for the first three years, I won't have to bother with this. Yes, but you want to build your platform for success, not for failure. So hopefully one day down the line, hopefully even faster than within three years, given internet speed, um, you, 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 you might become successful and big. And in which case, if you have no work process going, no standard operating procedure, no due diligence is set up, it'll be a painful awakening at, at your later successful, more successful stage. So plan for success, uh, familiarize self, yourself with this, even if technically you might still be meeting with an exclusion, um, definitorial exclusion. Uh, Dan, if you can go one step further. So what are the obligations that a OCSSP platform has to meet uh, once it falls under this law and is operating in Europe? Uh, it's enough to operate. You don't really have to be based in Europe as your headquarter. Well, you have to basically inquire whether there is a way of licensing um, the content that is being uploaded onto your platform. Um, and that may very well be the case for many types of content. People have really thought of music, 
snippets of newspapers, etc. There are extensive licensing schemes of a collective nature in place. And um, I think somewhat sheepishly, many platforms prior to this law have simply said, oh, we did not know, these, these things are hard to find, etc., etc. That will work less well. Now, in the STM space, um, that is not at the moment really true. Many, many publishers offer really the content themselves, and the situation is perhaps more similar to the um, uh, audiovisual sector, where, again, you have dedicated streaming services. You all would know Netflix or, 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 or Disney or Amazon. You have a few streaming services in audiovisual, and similarly, in, in, in science publishing, you have effectively publishers not wanting to license every mom and pop, every platform that might come along and say, oh, um, I, I would really like to distribute your content. It will be specialized platforms only. So you are falling under the second leg of the uh, obligations under two. And we can go to the next slide, Dan, if you, if, if you can be so kind. Thanks. So the second responsibility, so you would in a workflow sense have concluded there is no ready licensing scheme available for STM type content. Um, you may end up being liable if you allow anybody and everything to upload onto your platform uh, scientific uh, articles or uh, graphs, etc., that are under copyright and are obviously not uh, published under a CC by open access license. So what do you have to do? It's not that you are automatically liable in all cases. You basically have to apply best efforts and using necessary and relevant information to the extent that this is available or you're being drawn, your attention is being drawn to it. So, and this is where it, where the action point comes in for publishers. It's a real game changer that we are now not anymore in a situation where a platform can sit back and say, um, I'm just exempt, I have a safe harbor. They are under an obligation to demonstrate best efforts. So they have to come up with a documented story, if you will, what it is that they did in checking that the content uploaded on their site is in fact uh, not infringing. And uh, they have to take account of any information that is readily available from the rights holder. And you publishers have the ability, particularly in STM, where many publishers are totally familiar with the online and the document definition of a digital object, you can in fact make the metadata available so that platforms fairly effortlessly can find out whether content is compliant, is post embargo, is open access, or in fact is proprietary and should not be there either at all or at least not until an embargo has expired. Um, Dan, we can go to the next slide. So again, the, the, the platforms are actually presumed liable unless, so this is a, an, a, an important one, and I, just to recap for them really. First step, is, it, is there a license? Can I get a license? No, I cannot. Um, is there a way of detecting in the, in the sea of content which content should be there and which should not be there? And that's where hopefully uh, if publishers do their homework, uh, those platforms can be furnished with that information in a rather efficient manner. If there is no necessary and relevant information, so there might be publishers who say, yeah, actually, I don't really mind. In fact, for me, any kind of distribution is good. Um, I will only go after people, you know, my long or best sellers the really, the, the really uh, tertiary primary education methods for tertiary education, uh, that those are the ones I want to focus on. Um, not if somebody just uses a chapter, not if they use works that have a, a smaller audience, a bespoke audience. In that case, you'd be thrown on three 
as a platform and you can still like today wait until you receive that notice and take down uh, which uh, under uh, current law also means stay down so you'd have to permanently disable access uh, rapidly um, which can differ depending on what category of content it is what is cons what constitutes expeditiously um, Dan, if if you can help me with the next slide again so in practice failure to show waste efforts liable burden is there and a sector specific approach the law encourages and here i would do a plug for stm you might have seen it on the website links or otherwise go to the article sharing framework website where you can find out all about how in this sector um, there is a readily available schema that enables you to communicate the necessary and relevant information very conveniently embedded in uh, scientific articles or perhaps graphs of, of that are important to you or other atlases of uh, physiological atlases whatever you might be publishing um, and make that in uh, available it, it, in principle can be made available so that for the platform it's a widget that through an api or other automated stream can be received at the time of upload so even the uploader doesn't need to get upset they will know straight away on trying to upload yes this can be done no you need to upload a different version of the same work or no you are too early you will have to maybe wait another six months before this upload is uh, compliant of course this is voluntary in the sense that um, if you do not do that you're not really losing anything to your legal position in law you can still go after infringers you can still send them notices but um, I see there's an end missing on the collaboration. It is through making metadata that is necessary and relevant for enforcement available that you can nudge and encourage proactively platforms to work with you. And naturally, I would, I would really encourage you to consider this. Uh, it seems a far more rational and better idea than to do the whack-a-mole um, notice uh, and take down system. Then the next slide. I have just added this one in. So my principal drill down on Article 17, and hopefully we can also have a Q&A or comments from your side. I just wanted to throw the one slide in um, about Brexit. Um, you know, as the UK is no longer subject to the EU, still many platforms that operate in the UK will also operate in the EU. And, should consider EU law for that reason. But uh, technically, that is now a separate jurisdiction where different rules apply. And at the moment, there is even a standoff over jurisdiction uh, enforcement between the EU and, and, and the UK. So this is a space that perhaps merits a follow-up seminar. But since I have you all around, I thought I'd throw this one slide in to give you uh, a uh, snapshot there where the differences now lie coming quickly before inviting questions or comments back to to article 17 there are two interesting cases one remains pending before the european court of justice and the one you might have heard in in our sector it's called the youtube slash elsevier case um, effectively the two cases were not linked but they were um, throwing up very similar questions. So the Court of Justice in Europe dealt with them in one uh, hearing. And what that case wanted to know is prior to the DSM, what are actually the obligations of platform if there were no DSM? And in as the case hurtled forward and during the hearing, it was interesting to see that the judges, the 15 Grand Chamber, asked a lot of questions about what the dsm would add and how this would be different answering effectively a case predating the dsm but still throwing uh, light on what exactly the obligations are and um, i just want to 
quote from that case, uh, Article 84, uh, Paragraph 84, sorry, uh, which throws some light, and you will see why I'm, I'm reading this legalese. It is giving the, the platform resp responsibility it is dependent on relevant factors, which include circumstances such as the operator, despite the fact that it knows or ought to know in general sense, the users of its platform are making protected content available to the public illegally via its platform, refrains from putting in place technological measures that can be expected from a reasonably diligent operator in its situation in order to counter credibly and effectively copyright infringement on that platform. Now, I focus on this now. This is law that applies irrespective of whether you're on the DSM or not as a platform. So if you become aware, even generally, that there are these infringements, you now have the court clarifies you are expected as a reasonably diligent operator uh, to counter credibly and effectively these infringements, depending on your circumstances. And this, I now continue to quote, in selecting protected content illegally communicated to the public, that it provides tools on its platform specifically intended for the illegal sharing. So if you provide tools, you're in that category. Or if you promote knowingly such sharing, you are in that category. Um, if your financial model depends on sharing illicit content, you're in that category. So what I'm trying to say here by quoting from a judgment that um, predates the DSM in terms of when, it, when the case was lodged, it looks to me, and this maybe other people will have a different view, it looks to me like the DSM had an effect even beyond its strict application of, um, of platforms that are subjected to it. It has managed to influence the general level of respectable behavior that is expected of platforms, whether or not they are so-called OCSSPs. Um, the other case that could still have a bearing on these matters is a case involving the government of Poland that challenged Article 17 and wants it to be found the equivalent of unconstitutional, effectively in contravention of the Bill of Rights. Uh, ironically, I dare say for Poland, for infringing freedom of expression um, and to nullify Article 17. Now, again, I would argue even if Poland is successful, it would have in part not achieved what it wanted to do because of that YouTube slash Elsevier case, which has now almost taken the good behavior standard of the DSM, generalized it, perhaps lowered it somewhat for the general platforms, but still essentially increased it compared to the old simple safe harbor. And so enable effectively rights holders to look after their rights by furnishing relevant and necessary metadata and um, uh, force platforms then to collaborate. This is as far as the talk goes. Uh, Dan, you can move one over uh, where I just uh, want to leave you with a very general quote, but uh, born from uh, just the notion that copyright isn't the purpose in itself. It is to publish valuable content, to educate not only children, but us all, and is in that sense an engine of free speech in itself. Um, with that, I'm very happy if, uh, if there are comments or people who have their own views of, on these things or if we have time for questions and answers. I do not know if there is a moderator, so I might take it upon myself. Um, anyone? Uh, Dan, perhaps you could stop sharing and we can see more of each other. Carlo, I see one question in the um, comments. Okay. What do you think are the pros and cons of the UK implementing Article 17 or similar? If we do, what should we keep or omit? Ah, 
An excellent uh, question. Uh, hello, James. You're, of course, an expert in the field. So, um, yeah, uh, it's, it can make it quite simple, but it might not be so well understood if depending on how many lawyers are on the call. But basically, stop after paragraph four of the DSM. Take the first article one, two, three, and four subparagraphs, and then don't go all the way down to nine. That would be a nice way of using scissors and almost like a press cutting if you want to send that to the UK IPO. In reality, I'm being somewhat sheepish here. I don't think it would happen that way. You would see that Article 17, 1 through 4 set up the basic scheme of platform responsibility, co-responsibility. And then there are various mitigating factors following down, which take account um, situations where, let's say, for reasons of allowing parody or pastiche, uh, there are various nuances to this position. I see there's another question there, um, but now it's vanishing, let's see, I think from Sarah. Um, can, you, can you confirm not-for-profit is defined in context of OCCS? Are there likes of academia that edu and research get considered not-for-profits in this context? Um, excellent question, uh, Sarah. Um, not-for-profit is in fact one of the the exclusions I think people had in mind mainly repositories or or um, platforms that really have a, a different focus like Wikipedia so to my knowledge academia.edu um, there was actually in a scholarly kitchen today I think or yesterday a post about them that they received funding from 10 cents um, a uh, the certainly for-profit uh, listed company in China. Um, in spite of .edu, which is very questionable uh, why they managed to get a .edu domain name, it, it, it is a uh, privately funded entity to my knowledge. And the same goes for ResearchGate, um, which may have some funding. I, I think it was reported from the Gates Foundation. I don't think that's where the name ResearchGate comes from. But it, to my knowledge, it's a private company. So I don't know, Sarah, if the question was whether you have to make actually a profit to fall into this. I don't think that's required. Um, so even if those entities are more in fundraising as a business model, um, that, that wouldn't put them beyond. I don't see any other written question. There's actually no reason why not to open the floor if anyone would like to um, ask a question or if I went too fast in certain areas. I've tried to run through the slides uh, with you today. I hope that was okay for most of you today. Will the slides be available anywhere after, after the talk? Um, I certainly would find it good if, if you if they are available to those attending here I, I do not know if STM will make them generally available I would not have uh, anything against that in fact there are also notes when it comes to the global copyright scheme where and the, and the EU citations where you have useful links to the actual texts of those documents so thanks um, I will look into whether it can be generally put up. Good, we appreciate it. Thank you. Or whether it can at least be shared with those who, who are on this call. I don't see any other questions or comments. Um, I would say that maybe not everything I've said would be 100% uh, fine agreement with all platforms that um, are faced with a co-responsibility now in exactly the same way but I think you know fair people may disagree over the details but the overall drift is that platforms now have a greater responsibility than they did have prior to June 7 2021 
Right, so I might be able to give you a little time back uh, unless there are further comments or questions. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to attend. Uh, Dan, um, thank you for offering to host this uh, at very short notice and for helping me with the slides. You're very welcome, Carlo. Good job. And this concludes our session today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks.